Hi, everyone. Welcome to this closing press conference. I apologize for my raspy voice. It's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> Welcome to Effie Brown, Chester Algernal Gordon, Elegance Bratton, Jeremy Pope. Oh, down at the end. I got my order wrong. Raul Castillo and Gabrielle Union. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. We're so, we're so honored to have you. Uh, I have a couple of questions, and then we're going to turn it over to the press. So um, let's just dive in. You know, I was <clears throat> elegance. Here's what I was thinking. Um, the movie is, is, our is, is an introduction to you for some. Um, but I thought we would just start this, conf this press conference by just taking a half step back. Um, hear a little bit more about you before we dig into um, this collaboration with everyone on this stage. Uh, so, well, first, when we invited the film to, to be our closing night, you sent me a message on Instagram. <laughs> and you were like... Yeah, it I was, was a lot. It was a lot. Was really it was bad. a lot because you've been you've been following this festival. You've yeah. been following the filmmakers in this festival, and and you're part of this tradition now. So yes. I thought I'd give you a moment just to oh my gosh, to speak to you. that. Thank you as an opener. Well, I'm a I'm from New Jersey. I'm Bridge and Channel for yeah. sure. You know, yeah. and New, I'm from the New New York side of New Jersey. And we grew up. My mother had me when she was 16. We didn't have much money. So we just go to New York and look at stuff for free, like go to museums, come to Lincoln Center when there was, you know, promotional things like this. So, you know, I've been aware of the New York Film Festival since I was a very small child. And then when I got to film school, that awareness turned into a mission because our professors were like, You're, if you really want to make it, you got to play the New York Film Festival. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. You know, you start over. So, um, so when I found out that we were closing the 60th anniversary festival, this past 60 years of cinema and what this festival has done to broaden the conversation around what is cinema and who, is, who gets to make it, men, women, people of color, queer people, my favorite filmmakers, Gio Pontecorvo, Pedro Almodovar closed last year. Pedro Almodovar is like, literally like my best director friend in my head. Like I talk to Pedro in the shower. We, I ask him what I'm, should I wear? Should I wear these shoes or that shoe? He speaks Spanish in these things. So, um, <laughs> but suffice it to say, this is a dream come true. This is for me to be, have this be my first film and to be invited into what I consider to be the most hollowed space for film in the world and to be a part of this 60 year legacy. I don't know how many black gay men have held the closing spot. Mm. So I'm gonna assume that I'm the first until someone tells me different. Yeah. So Thank I'm really know. proud. <laughs> Own it, yes. <laughs> and, so, and so with the inspection, you hone in on a very specific moment in your, in your life. Yes. We, we understand what comes before and then you hone in on this very specific time mm -hmm. and experience. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could uh, open up the discussion a bit by telling us how and when you decided to focus on this very specific w moment as a window into sure. your whole life and, and bringing your own life to the screen. Sure, the inspection is about a homeless black gay man who joins the Marine Corps to win his mother's love. He's willing to endure any trial for her validation, but ultimately he learns how to respect himself through surviving boot camp. And that's my story. Um, so to say where it came from, you know, it comes way before I even knew that I would be here. I, I've been telling people, people are like, what is it like to have this moment in your career happen? And I'm like, I don't know what to say, <laughs> except to say that when I was homeless, I said a prayer for this, mm. you know? And I didn't know, I just wanted to thrive one day. I didn't want to be stuck in that survival loop. And I had no idea back then that God had said yes. Right, mm -hmm. that I that this whole time God had said yes to me, and each step, each failure, each success was a part of that yes. So to arrive at this moment now, I have to go back, and it all boils down to I was, I I 
was a combat filmmaker in the Marine Corps in Hawaii. I got a chance to be stationed in New York City, but I have to give up being a combat artist and become a military police officer. It so, so happens when I came here, my sister was graduating from elementary school. And my mom is the type of woman who's like, oh, you a cameraman now? You better go buy a camera and film her graduation, right? So I did, I went out and I spent every dollar I had on the camera I used, a Sony PD-150 for those who like <laughs> Maho and Drive, um, uh, and a computer to be able to go and film my sister's grad graduation from elementary school. I get there, no one even knew she had a brother. People didn't know my mother had a firstborn son, and it incensed me because I'd spent, at that point, about 15 years between you know getting kicked out of the house and you know getting to the Marine Corps, struggling with my family and thinking that we were in it together. Mm -hmm. So I resolved in that moment, you are not going to ignore me. I'm going to be a filmmaker. You're going to go to the multiplex and you're going to see my poster and see my name. You're going to turn on the television and you're going to see my show. And someone in your life is going to say hey, I think that's your son, you know? So that's the first part is just that feeling of being invisible and finding, and I've dealt with that feeling my whole life, but it wasn't until I joined the Marine Corps and I got a camera that I have any tool to remedy that problem, right? And then when I got to the Marine Corps, I arrived there thinking I was completely worthless. I was kicked out because of who I am. Right, so how do you start your adult life <laughs> if you don't even have the basis of yourself, right? And then I got to the Marines and I found out I was important because of my ability to protect the person to my left and to my right. And that was transformational for me. And I feel like in this moment in you know, world history, American history in particular, we are all kind of like polarized. The left is yelling, the right is yelling at the left. It's a mess. And to me, I wanted to give what I felt was the most important thing I got from the Marine Corps, which is that lesson. You only matter in your ability to protect and serve the person to your left and to your right. And I thought in this moment, this is a good message to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm gonna bring in more folks sitting here. Chester, hi. Hi. It's great to see you. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you to, to share with the press a little bit about, um, well, your, your connection, partnership, collaboration with elegance. And it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a vital part of building what we just saw is this bond between the two of you. So I want to invite you to, to share a bit of that with us. Sure. Um, so I'm Chester, Elegance and I are Mary, and I, I'm also his producing partner. I've produced all of his work up until now. Um, we were, I guess it all started when we were sitting on our like shitty couch after we went on tour for Peer Kids and we, Elegance was like, you know, I wanna write a narrative feature. And it was between Walk For Me, his uh, short, and this. And, you know, I was like, you should do the thing that only you can tell, you know, and share your experience with everyone. And he wrote it. And I think like through this process, I just, I. I've, he told me all of his stories. I've met all of his Marine buddy friends. And they all have this like unbreakable bond whenever you, whenever I've met them and they're so different from each other. But I guess I just remind him, you know, to stay true to himself. And, you know, of all the things, like I knew that he loved Indie Rock, for instance. So it's like clearly you need Animal Collective, you know, to, to do the thing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, it, it's really his idea, you know. And the two of you were going in this direction of the inspection, and now I'm bringing Effie Brown into the picture. Um, you, you said yesterday in a student screening that we did that, that you were manifesting Effie Brown early on, and then you had a meeting with her in her- We manifested, thank you. In her, in her, <laughs> in her WeWork office. Yeah. We talked about this yesterday. So, so um, share that, uh, your side of the, of the you know, story I've, with us and how this. I'm so excited to be here and I just wanna say thank you so much for inviting me to this party. It's really, it's really amazing and also to be working with such talented people and I'm looking down there, you know what I mean? Like really thank you. Um, I, I work uh, at a company called Game Changer where our motto is you can't make something about us, 
without us. Mm -hmm. And that was something um, that I've always held true with the films that I've been able to produce, right? Effie runs a company. Oh, right, sorry, I run, yes, I run. Game Changer. I Just do, right, we're a finance, production, and development company. Title. And we're, um, we're able to write a check. And that's very rare sometimes <laughs> these days. Mm -hmm. And when Chester and Elegance came into my office, I took over the company in 2020. And you know what happened in 2020. Um, you know, I was like, yeah. And I wanted to have this company start out on the right foot. And when they came in and they showed me this script, I literally, you know, was trying to play it cool, but I was like, do they not know that I'm gonna take this movie? This is gonna be our movie together. We're gonna do it together, you know? And, and it was really, really wonderful. And I have to say that it means so much that you were able to take such a personal experience and then be able to make it a narrative experience for, for all. And the conversation from the left to the right, conservative, liberal, like all of those things were really important. And then, you know, once Jeremy, Gabrielle, and Raul came on, you know what I mean? Like it was a not, it was like, and scene, let's go. Mm -hmm. So we were really excited that this is one of the first films that we were able to co-finance with A24. We need to give love to them because it's very hard doing an independent movie and especially a movie like this without the sort of backing of a distributor and studio like that. So with all of these wonderful combinations together, able to stick to the integrity, able to stick to the authenticity and to bring this level of talent, I was like, I'm in 100%. Thank you. That's off my soapbox now, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Gabrielle, hello, Jeremy, Hi. Raul. What's going on? Um, I want to ask one question to sort of lay a further foundation, and then I want to hand the conversation over to the press, um, but just to sort of lay the foundation. In the case of each of you, if you don't mind, Gabrielle, Jeremy, and Raul, um, tell us about how, how you connected with this creative team and also why. What was your... What? We'll, just, we'll just go down this way. <laughs> Jeremy, you want to start, Jeremy? I'll start. I can start for you. Um, I was fortunate to uh, read the script. Um, it was during the summertime pandemic. Um, and I connected with Elegance uh, shortly after via Zoom. And we just talked. We talked about what it means to be artists, what it means to be black queer men in this world, and kind of how we wanted to be of service um, in the arts and how we could use our gifts and our talents um, and our stories to do so. I was very moved by his spirit and his energy. I'm a very, I'm attracted to good energy and special energy and you know, so he spoke to me in, in a very specific way and I knew I wanted to go on this journey with him. But I also knew that what it meant by me saying yes or offering up my, my being to say yes to him was that I would have to make space for him because the things that we were talking about in the story, the things that were happening to him in real life were still very much on the surface and real and happening to him to, in, this, in the sense of, I was gonna have to make space for him to go through it and heal. We were gonna be healing together. And that's a very vulnerable place to be in. Um, so I, I knew that by saying yes, that that's what I would have to do. So as we got to Mississippi and we made this film, which you guys watched today, some days were very tough and very emotional, <laughs> and we had to hold each other up um, in a way I had never felt. I'd never been directed by a black queer man who was going, I see you, I feel you, I know where you're coming from. We don't have to talk about it. And that was very safe. Um, so you know, to be a part of that experience, I felt like for me, this project was about me being a vessel for something bigger. I knew that by me stepping into the, the shoes of French, I was going to be speaking to something bigger and something that I couldn't see but the faith that I have was that it was going to make a difference for somebody because me and Elegance talked about if only we had had a film like this, how we would have felt seen, respected, and loved, and supported. So that was why I said yes and why we went on the journey in which we did. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember who hit me first, if it was Effie or Elegance, but maybe at the same time. <laughs> uh, and I read the script, it's a tremendous piece of work, and uh, immediately I'm, you know, assuming producer, because I don't know who I would be in this, in this piece. And they're like, no, we want you, you know, Elegance, I want you to play my mother. And I was like, I 
what what have I ever given off <laughs> that makes yeah. anyone <laughs> think that I could I could even become close to to embodying a, a character like this? And um, and he said it, it can only be you. And that the level of confidence that that they have had in me, that that Jeremy has had in me, that everyone has had in me, they gave me confidence I didn't. I did, I've never had in myself in as an actor. Um, and throughout this process, I, I went from an entertainer to, to mm. being a real actor. I went from judging the characters that I played, kind of making fun of them through the work, into trying to find our common ground in their humanity. And it changed everything. And uh, I mean, I, as some of you may know, um, I have a trans child and we do this work every day, mm -hmm. right? We do the work of keeping our children alive and loved and, and seen and, and um, you know, try to give uh, not just her, but all of the children opportunities and love and, and all of the things. And we're often, my husband and I are confronted with parents who are just like, I don't know how to love my children. And it all, that is such a, a foreign concept to me. That is not my ministry, as the kids say. Mm. Um, and I could never, I could, I could just never, I never knew what to say to people like that. And now, in, through the excavation, um, the deep dive into who she was before she got to this point, and to try to find that humanity has given, actually given me the tools to reach more parents who don't know how to love their kids fully, completely, without condition. Um, and so, I mean, the whole, the whole experience has just been, you know, a blessing. And, and when they were like, you know, we, we want you to, you know, be the first one in the, in the pool. And I'm like, well, who do you want to play you, Elegance? And he was like, Jeremy Pope. And as most producers do, I slid into his DMs. <laughs> 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 Whatever, whatever you do, you got to do whatever it takes. <laughs> and I was like, are you, are you, are you really considering this? Because I think we could really take this somewhere mm -hmm. special and be very impactful and transformative for not just our lives, but everybody's life. And, and he was like, I want to do it. So say less. I'm on the bus. Just drive it. And <laughs> it is, it's just been a tremendous experience. How lucky am I? Well, <laughs> um, I got sent the script um, last year and read it and absolutely loved it. I knew this was the kind of story I, I wanted to tell. Um, and the kind of character that I, I was really ex excited to play, I looked at Elegance's name, and I, it's not a name you easily forget. And I said, why does this name sound familiar? Elegance, Brad. And so I went to my emails, and I, no, Elegance. I went to my texts. Elegance had approached me at Tribeca Film Festival in 2018, I think it was, 2017, and told me about this project that he had. And at the time, I'd become very skittish. I just said yes to too many things, and, and, and I, I, so I'd ignored Elegance's text <laughs> from, from 2017, and I felt very sheepish. And, and I said, well, I'll put a tape together, and hopefully he's still interested in me for this role, um, uh, because this is what a... What a Profound character with a profound story, and and I would be so lucky to be a part of this, if he will still consider me for it. So, I put the tape together and we sent it off, and I was like, here's hoping, and and then we were on a Zoom a couple weeks later, and and it's been a, an incredible journey ever since. Thank you. Okay, let's um, let's open it up to the press in the room, and let's find out what questions you have. We'll start here in the front row. Uh, we'll just wait for the mic one sec. We'll get for the recording, and so we can all hear you. Hello, and uh, Dwight Casimir at the Times Weekly in Chicago. We know each other. And uh, congratulations to both of you and the rest of you for a really powerful and honest film. And um, Elias, I just want to know from you, I mean, to me, one of the most painful things to do is to resurrect mm -hmm. ghosts of your past and really mm -hmm. face it. What, what made you and gave you the courage to just put it all out there the way you did, and, and the, this particular subject and point in your life. Thank you for that. It's a great question. Um, the person that has helped me through that the most is my partner, Chester. Um, before we got on set, Chester came to me and said, you have to be vulnerable in this process. 
you cannot be afraid to show people your truth. And I took that as a mission, right? To not be ashamed. You know, my mother passed before we got a chance to finish the film. And, um, you know, I just wanna say thank you to you, Gabby, for bringing her back for me and providing that closure. I understood that I couldn't be pro protective. I had to express it because we live in a world where it's like, you know, one out of two black gay men are predicted to have HIV in their lifetime. Queer kids are eight times more likely to be homeless, eight times more likely to commit suicide. And I wanted to make sure to make something like Jeremy said that I needed when I was that age. And, and I needed to share to do that. And by doing so, I'm hoping that these kids realize that the struggles that they're going through, they can triumph over it, right? They're not to be defined by their trauma. They're defined by their resilience and their resolve, you know? Um, and I, so that's really what it came down to. I was thinking about all those people like me who didn't have a film like this and I wanted to make sure I reached out. And, and that's another reason why Gabby had to be in the movie, right? Because my mother, she can ignore me all she wants, mm. but somebody in her life is gonna say, I heard Gabrielle Union is pretending to be you. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> so, you know, in that regard, I have to be vulnerable in this process. And, and, and to be honest with you, this film is not the moment I decided to work through this. I've been working through this stuff since I was 16 years old. This is the moment where I felt strong enough, right, to actually dig it up and to see it, where I felt like I, I had moved, I don't wanna say I moved on, but I'd done a lot of self work to get to this point. But I needed to know, like, it's the last thing I'll say is a story, you know, towards the end of the film, in the hallway, right? She says to him, I could have left you in any shoebox. Whenever there was trouble in my household, that was one of the first things my mother would say, probably from the time I was like 14 years old. And I believed her. I believed I deserved to be left in that shoebox, that I was worthless because of who I am, you know? So to be in a scene where I'm having to do like multiple takes and cuts, by the end of the day, I was a mess, just crying, screaming, really, really upset. And then I got in my car, I went back to my hotel, I ordered some dinner, and I was fine, you know? I needed to know that I'd actually healed from this. And that particular line, right? I was able to leave all of that shame behind on that. That What you're seeing in the performance is me letting go of stuff I had been carrying for years that I didn't need to carry anymore, but I would never have known I was still carrying it unless I had the gracious talent of these folks here to, to open that up. So, you know, I have to be open. I don't have a choice. It's hard for me to see. I think there's a hand right there and then we'll go right there. Yes, hi, and then we'll go here. Jeremy, I adore you. Ah. <laughs> I have a question for you, Jeremy. Um, you will hear horror stories about people who's in the Army, Navy, and the Marines. And how did you, like, to play a, a role like this? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, from the 90s and the 80s and the 70s, like queer people didn't have a chance to be in the Marine, to be in the Army because they would get bullied or they would call or whatever. What, did, what step did you take to play a role like this? Um, the sad truth about that is for a lot of queer individuals and for myself, a black queer man, most of your life you spend hiding pieces of yourself, of yourself to survive. Mm. So the sad part is the answer is that part was easy mm. because that was something that was comfortable. I don't think I came out to my family, to my loved ones um, until I was 21 in New York City. Um, and it was actually because I had done an interview where I was playing a gay character in a play. And you know they had asked the right questions for me to open up and say, oh, I'm pulling from real experience. And I was nervous because I was about to be outed in a publication. Mm -hmm. So before that happened, I went and I called my mom and was like, this is happening in, in tears because I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. But that is the reality for a lot of us. We spend so much of our years and our life hiding um, and being able to navigate to code switch 
in, you know, in institutions and situations just to be safe. Um, so in being able to talk to Elegance about his experience and what that was like and the don't ask, don't tell. And what we wanted to make sure was that, you know, French, you know, it wasn't that he, he, he wasn't comfortable in his queerness. It was him trying to survive. There was a mission. I need my mom to see me. So it was like, there, it was a clear, you know, one way for him to get to this graduate. I need to graduate so that she will value me and respect me. Um, so I feel very grateful again that I was being directed by someone who had gone through this, a black queer man that outside of what our script was saying, we could talk about what was happening in life. And there were certain days where while I was carrying a lot of his, he was carrying a lot of mine. And that's why this film was so healing and important for me just on my human journey, on my, on my, on my path of life. Because I walked out of this film feeling stronger and feeling more confident in my black and in my queer. So let's go here, right, third row, yes. Um, thank you, everyone. Tremendous film. Um, something that I found really moving was how French's character was able to provide healing for other characters like Ismael um, in particular. Um, I'd love to know if you could sort of just talk a little bit about how that, how his own acceptance and healing for himself really impacted the, um, the rest of um, his team in the Marines. Thank you for that question. It's a very good question. Um, when it comes down to it, French's emotional journey in this, first of all, French is a person who doesn't give up on anybody. Because if he gives up on people, he gives up on himself, right? So on that note, it's all re really about how being defiantly your truest, most authentic self will undoubtedly inspire people around you to do the same. But when you're in a situation like boot camp, right? This is not a space for political discourse. There is no space to decide whether the war in Iraq is right or wrong or any of that, right? I don't like carrots. I don't want to eat carrots. No one cares if you don't like carrots. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so like, you know, so in that regard, that human connection, right? This idea of each one of these men come to the Marine Corps with an expectation of what being a real man is supposed to be. And that expectation is a projection, right? So each one of them falls short. The drill instructors fall short. The kids fall short. The parents fall short. It's impossible to live up to it. But when you have someone like an Ellis French there who is resolute and not giving up on the people around him and resolute and, 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 and defiant about being themselves, that, that's resistance. That's the commentary on the war, right? That I, I deserve to be here as I am, you know? And then once people see that around them, they're like, okay, maybe I deserve to be here and maybe I deserve to be here but then they need a person like Ellis to draw that strength. So I was really, you know, for me in my life, I'm a perpetual optimist, you know? I made this film out of a spirit of like, I've learned how to be there for other people. I've learned that forgiveness is strong. Forgiveness is the actual source of strength, right? It's, not, it's easy to reject. It's so difficult to forgive. So to me, French's kind of radical empathy is a transformational force within the boot camp experience. And that's why it, it's, it's written the way that it is, where they find the little glimmers, the little bits, specks of light, right? Then they're able to express their humanity and find that bond outside of the system. And then once we start bonding outside of systems, things get very dangerous for those who mm -hmm. oppress us. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that's really where it came from. Okay, we can... Okay, a couple more. Yeah, let's go. Oh, I see, you're right, you're right. All the way up, yeah, here in the center, and then please all the way to the back, yes. Thank, thank you, thank you for the really wonderful film. Um, in regard to what you had just said, I, I'm really curious about the boot camp dynamics and the levels of intimidation, mm -hmm. and at the same time, the um, levels of courage expressed, like with the target 
uh, the mm. target challenge yeah. and the willingness of others to speak up. Um, I was thinking a lot when I was watching the boot camp, the whole boot camp thing of, of course, Full Metal Jacket and the degree of influence that that may have had and how you veered in very subtle ways away from that at the same time as perhaps being influenced by it. Sure. Um, you know, in terms of the kind of strategy of presentation, of visual presentation, you know, I view this as a hybrid film. When we are in French's point of view, it's kind of like a European uh, handheld movie, like Claire Denis Beautravail, right? And then when we see French operating in the world, it's very composed, like a full metal jacket and stylized. The idea is to, and mind you, this is all intentional, right? Don't Ask, Don't Tell may have gotten its name in the 90s, but in reality, queer troops, queer service members have been around for almost 100 years, being silenced, bashed, and oppressed, right? So in that regard, it was really important to create a visual language that established the shaky ground that queer service members have stood on for the last 100 years, right? So there's that element of it. And then in terms of the influences, you know, it's funny because our location is the Miliota Police Academy, which mm. was built by Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Tuggle. He is very cute, also very married, so <laughs> stay out of his DMs. But, um, but... <laughs> But, um, you know, he was a Marine. He went to boot camp in 1987. I went to boot camp in 2005. His base was a replica from memory of his boot camp experience. My film is a, re is a, is a honor to the memory of my boot camp experience. There's a kind of poetic symmetry there. So when it comes to like movies like Full Metal Jacket or Jarhead, boot camp hasn't changed in the last really that 100 years all that much. But what has changed is who's able to go, right? Mm. And when we think about the US military, it's easy to kind of get into the trap of like US foreign policy and to forget what's most important to this film, which is the troop. This is a pro-troop film, right? This is not an anti-military or a pro-military film. It's a pro-troop film, right? Mm. And when we look at it like that, you know, it's, the military has been one of the most progressive organizations in the history of the United States, right? First place that was integrated. First place where there's equal pay. Gays can get married. Gays can serve openly, right? It's not to say that it's a perfect place, but it's a microcosm of the world that we live in. So when I'm talking about that deviation from what we expect of boot camp, it's important to honor spending time with a black gay person in that space because we've been there the whole time. Right, and that subjective European camera style, that being close to him when he's thinking, right, finding space outside of performance, right? It's not about how you vogue or how you shoot. It's about living and breathing with him. I, I don't know if you saw this yet, but I keep saying I have a Kate Blanchett test, right? Can an actor sit in front of a camera and just emote and we know what's come before and we know what's coming. We have a sense of what's to come. Jeremy passes that with flying colors. And it's that type of intimacy and subjectivity that I think differentiates this film from you know, the incredible references that you mentioned that are very much a part of this process. Is that Harlan in the back? Hi, Gene. I've been locked in combat here with my friend Brandon to get your attention, so I hope to hand off to him Great. afterwards. <laughs> um, this actually is a question for Effie. I'm curious about Game Changer Films. I'd like to, you to discuss, if you would, a little bit about um, the, you're a nine-year-old company, and uh, I'd like you to discuss the, how the, the mission has evolved over these nine years in terms of what you're looking for in terms of production. And also, if you could discuss just catch me up a little bit on what your finance model is. Do you have outside investors in your company or do you finance on a picture by picture basis? Just make me smart about you know, what it is that you're doing. Absolutely, and thank you for that. So Game Changer Films was started in 2013 and it started, um, it was as a film fund just for women. And so when I took it over in 2020, um, I had previously been trying to start a film fund of our own, but the thing is when you have a lot of women, people of color, all of that good stuff, you know what we don't have access to is money and resources. So when someone came to me and said, hey, F, would you ever run someone else's fund? I was like, hell yeah. 
But I said, you know, I'm tired of us always being siloed off. You know, I'm black and I'm a woman. You're like, you're this or you're that. I said, I want women, people of color, LGBTQ+, as well as people with disability. We have to be able to amplify all of those voices. Because all, like you say, like, as you always say, like, all the tide rises all boats, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so we really, when I took it over in 2020, that mission changed from women to being, um, I don't want to say marginalized, but you know, the voices of the people that I know, right? You know what I'm, and the stories that I like to watch and I, I like to tell, and there's also a resonance with that. So um, our mission is like we say very clearly, you can't make something about us without us, which was why it was very important to have an out gay man play the role of Ellis, which was why it was very important to have Elegance and Chester be the ones leading the charge. And, um, and then so, so that, and also we're really interested in changing the face of Hollywood from the inside out. To get to, um, to, get to the point of like, where do you get your money from? It's actually both places. So we have equity within the company where we're able to finance and develop. We're actually working on a project with Miss Gabrielle Union again. I know, I'm like, thank you. I'm, like, I'm holding on to people's coattails like nobody's business and I don't care. I'm really all about that, right? Um, and then we also have a fund where we're able to do project by project. And we're right now in the process of expanding so that we can do more wonderful work like this. And I'm thank you so much for asking the question because I think I'm not the only one, but I feel like I'm one of the only ones, right? You know what I mean? Like, I hope there can be more of us to be able to write a check and be able to back projects such as this. So thank you so much for asking that question. And really, thank you again for letting me have the opportunity to write a check you know, and be able to produce with you. Thank you for the bunny. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon? Um, Coin. I was... I was interested in some of your inspirations. Did Isaac Julian have an effect on you, James Baldwin or Cheryl Dunye? Oh, sure. And is your <laughs> next film also going to be dealing with gay subject matter? Well, you know, I'm gay, so there's always a little glitter magic on everything I do. But, um, <laughs> no, um, in terms of my influences for this film, uh, Chester really was insistent upon um, really making me aware of people like Sally Mann, the photographer Sally Mann, who shoots such brilliant southern landscapes. Uh, people like William Eggleston, um, particularly his Clouds book, was really informative for this. Full Metal Jacket, Beau Travai, Moonlight, um, and also Rocky. Rocky yeah. was a huge influence Ooh. on me while I was writing this film. I would watch Rocky like, I don't know, I've, I mean, I've seen Rocky like. 800 times before I started writing this. I probably saw it an additional 300 times while writing this. You know, um, that hero's journey is really important to me. Um, and then just overall influences, you know, my favorite painter is Caravaggio. My second favorite painter is Velasquez. I'm interested in um, the work, obviously, you know, James Baldwin is a huge influence. Isaac Julian is a massive influence. Um, Gio Pontecorvo, another New York film festival icon uh, who did the movie Battle of Algiers, you know, uh, just, my, my, if I could summarize myself as an artist and filmmaker in one sentence, I would say that I have cinematic dyslexia and that I don't see a difference between documentary and fiction. I believe that they are two different pathways to uh, an essential and universal truth. So the type of art that I like is reflective of that. You know, I, I like uh, the the, uh, the Frederick Weissman. I like the Maisels. I like mm. Nan Golden. I like. Uh, Jenny Livingston, you know, I, I, my, my influences are quite a, as diffuse as my worldview. I want to thank this whole group for spending this time with us, for sharing this film with us, and we look forward to celebrating you tonight at the New York Film Festival as we close our 60th. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.